who has been adept at raising issues of social justice, especially with regard to the intersectionality of racial justice and disability concerns. Welcome and thank you for your commitment to people with disabilities and their families. Thank you, Pam. Um, I, uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be able to speak to you today. I, um, every day that I'm in office, which has now been almost 20 years, uh, I've been thankful to uh, the opportunity that you all give me to speak out on behalf of Vermonters, uh, particularly those who are most struggling to get by day-to-day -day living, whether it be uh, issues with uh, disabilities, whether it be economics, whether it be uh, social stereotypes and challenges that people are facing. Uh, and so it's a real honor to speak with you today. Um, when I think about what government is, can be, and should be, uh, and what our country and our state is, can be, and should be, uh, I envision a place where with the resources that we have, nobody is left in a situation where uh, they can't meet their <coughs> needs, where they don't have the services to live with dignity, uh, and that is what defines a civil society in my mind. Now, we always have to deal as political figures within the constraints of what our society is willing to put in in the form of taxes and revenues and then figure out how to try to meet the needs which are greater than those resources. What frustrates me about that box is that we have some of the fastest growing wealth inequality and income inequality that we've seen in decades, almost a century, and yet we are saying there aren't enough resources out there to help remedy those inequities and to help provide those services that in a civil society that we can and should be, uh, need to be met. So I can't speak on behalf of uh, the governor. Uh, he doesn't include me in what his vision of the state is on a day-to-day -day basis, so I'm not speaking on behalf of the governor. Uh, I think he'll be speaking to you later today. Um, and I hope that you have good questions for him, um, because a lot of the discussion that comes from the top leadership in the state has to do, includes the words, taking care of our most vulnerable. And there are many groups that are vulnerable. There are many groups that are our most vulnerable. Uh, I would have to say the group we are with today should be in that category with respect to those that we will not leave behind. <clears throat> but when we level fund services, when we cut services for people to be able to stay in their homes and get the assistance they need, uh, when we don't have the adequate resources that we've known is true for years and years and years. I don't know how one can say this budget meets the needs of those who are most vulnerable. And it's important that those of us who are allies speak up in, for these issues. But it's also important, <clears throat> as many of you already do, that you speak up and make it clear that the needs that are out there are not being met. And it is inappropriate as leaders to say we are meeting the needs of the most vulnerable when we are not. Because those of us who have a voice to project what's happening in the state as elected leaders who often have the microphone who have the ear and eyes of the media attention on us on a daily basis, if we portray a false reality, then many people out there that don't see your reality on a day-to-day -day basis will not understand the real need that is out there. And
and therefore will not be as, um, as friendly to the idea that we need to have the resources to meet those needs. Because they say, why pay more? The needs are being met. That's what we're being told. So um, I just want to say that I'm someone who understands that. I'm someone who is willing to speak out about that. But the work I've done over the 20 years that I've served has always been um, bolstered by the participation of all of you and everybody else outside of this building. And so I thank you for coming in today to bring your voice from outside and around the state into the building to meet with your legislators, representatives, and senators. Tell them about the reality, not the story that's being told. And to communicate with the media and to communicate for op-eds, but just tell the story of the truth that's out there so that people recognize that there seems to be this disconnect between reality and the political rhetoric. So I thank you for whatever way you can participate in that part of elevating the public consciousness. Well, I will do it in whatever way that I can. And to wrap up, because I know there's other speakers, I'd like to pass around some business cards so you can reach out to me. And also a couple of clipboards that if you want them, you can sign up for an electronic newsletter from my office, which is one of the ways I try to tell the story of what's going on in this building beyond what you hear in one minute news clips or sound bites. And I would also welcome your story in these newsletters. I try to put out a paragraph or two from any group that wants, which then might have links to more information to say, here's what's really happening. And I send this to thousands of Vermonters to try to get your story and your truth out there in ways that sometimes they can't hear or they're not necessarily part of BCDR's newsletter list. So I ask you if you want one, as long as there's enough to take a, a card, sign up for the newsletter, and please reach out anytime and know that I'm more than willing to help tell your story uh, in the process. Thank you. continue to uh, 
voice is heard, you know, um, go to town hall meetings, you know, make appointments with legislators uh, ahead of time when you come to an estate house event, um, get your voices heard on, you know, however you can. Um, you know, and really, legislators need to know what self-advocacy is, and self-advocacy, when I say that, it's a movement, not a program, and it's for people with disabilities to speak up and gain independence and, you know, take responsibility for their own actions and also just to get their voices heard. Disability rights. Um, uh, I was, in the past, I, I was their president, um, and, but Pam asked me to stand in for her. Um, her voice has taken a trip out of state. <laughs> and she's going to follow it tomorrow morning, I hope. Um, our theme today of Disability Awareness Day is our community, our health, and our well-being. And with, oops, I suppose. Testing. Ooh, look at that. Okay. And our well-being. Um, with all that's going on in the world and the state lately, this is a timely theme. And I think that you folks know and experience what those things outside of what is strictly medical have an effect on our health and well-being. Our housing, our ability to get work, our ability to get support just to get out in the community. Um, and those are all very much, those are all issues that are very much in play this year when we look at what's on the uh, agenda in the legislature, um, either that's been put there by legislators or very much, maybe even more pertinently, what's been put there in the uh, administration's uh, budget proposal. Um, so we've got um, a number of folks have, have made this um, possible for us, and I'm not reading this right, but I will look at some different notes and, and just say that um, before I hand the microphone over, um, I want to thank the, the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council, the um, Vermont Statewide Independent Living Council, and the Uni University of Vermont Center on uh, Disability and Community Inclusion. These partners <coughs> give you the green you know they give us the money to make this kind of gathering happen and there's more of that than needed than you might think it takes a lot to organize this kind of thing and to you know everything from buses to food and the food is going to be great this evening um, and to bring our special guests who are listening in and I won't give that away yet at this point but there's there's a number of uh, factors that go into that and so I just wanted to make sure um, uh, before we get too far that I thank those folks because what they do is very important uh, to our movement. I want to also thank the member organizations of VCDR because their contributions are a big part of this as well. And I want to thank all of you for showing up. I've been floating around the State House, running around from different um, committees and different things that I've had to do today. And everywhere I have gone, I've seen the halls full of people with disabilities, their families, their allies, folks who care. And that's what makes a difference. We have got to show people a reality to the statistic that one in five Vermonters are living with a serious disability. Now, if you expand that to family members, that's pretty much everybody, if you really think about it. So thank you all very much for coming. So one of the things that affects our well-being as adults, insofar as we've been accused of being adults, um, is our education. And right now, there are things being discussed that have maybe a glimmer of positive to them and a glimmer of negative to them in terms of our special education system. And to talk about that is going to be one of the most informed people I know on the subject of, subject of special education, who has represented many people uh, to get what they need out of the system, and that's a free and appropriate public education for people with disabilities. So I'm going to hand it over to Marilyn Mahusky, 
who works in the Disability Law Project of Vermont's Legal Aid. is just awesome and I think it's really wonderful as that said for everyone to be here to be advocating and making uh, the rights and the needs of people with disabilities um, visible. So Ed had asked me to speak or I've been asked to speak about um, legislation that's pending before the, well actually just came out of the House Education Committee um, relative to changes in funding in special education. Um, and I want to start by, you know, acknowledging and recognizing and reminding everybody that students with disabilities have a legal right to receive special education and related services tailored to their individualized educational needs. This federal entitlement came about after years of children being warehoused and excluded from our public schools. Starting in 1974 with the passage of the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act, the predecessor to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Congress remedied this inequity. As Ed said, children with disabilities are entitled to a free and appropriate education in the least restricted environment. In an effort to save money on special education, funding that admittedly makes it up a big part of our local budgets, the House Education Committee has passed a bill out of committee that would fundamentally alter the funding model for special education. In addition, the bill seeks to reduce the reported high number of Vermont students determined eligible for special education by identifying and providing support to struggling students early on. The rationale being that early intervention will obviate the need for higher cost special education costs in the future. While well, identifying and supporting students who need additional support early is certainly best practice and a laudable goal, it must not obfuscate or stand in the stead of the state's responsibility under federal law to provide a free and appropriate public education to students with disabilities. Other states, including Texas, have shifted, who have shifted to a census-based funding model, which is the model being discussed at, at our state house, for funding special education have faced federal investigations stemming from a failure to timely identify and deliver services to children with disabilities and to children with suspected disabilities. While Iran is not Texas, any bill that fundamentally shifts the delivery of educational supports to struggling students and away from students with federal entitlements to individualized education plans must have clear guidelines for determining when a child's needs are not being met by the multi-tiered system of supports and a special education is uh, evaluation is warranted. Any delay in the identification of a student with a suspected disability is a violation of the student's rights under the IDEA. Any denial in the delivery of special education services to students with disabilities is a violation of their rights under the IDEA. As the bill moves forward but to consideration by the Senate, we hope that the bill will be strengthened by an affirmation that local school districts are not relieved of their obligations despite a lack of funding to ensure that the educational needs of students with disabilities are met. And certainly the Disability Law Project will continue to monitor and to advocate for any, uh, to ensure that as this bill moves forward, the rights of students with disabilities are not weakened. Thank you. Next up, uh, I think y'all know Max. Max Barrows from G Green Mountain Self Advocates. Max, here you go. Well, I guess my name was already said, but I'll say it again. My name is Max Barrows, and I work for Green Mountain Self Advocates as Outreach Director. And I am a person with uh, autism, and I receive developmental services. I'm here today to tell you straight up that we do not support the governor's recommended budget cuts for developmental services. The $4.3 million cut is yet another blow to our system. We need to be proactive, not reactive. Without services, I am sitting at home. That will have a negative impact on my self-esteem. And it's not gonna make my mother very happy either. <laughs> services to work. Uh, my job gives me confidence and connections to people. It puts strength in me and I learn from people. 
It puts positivity in my spirit, and the stronger I am, the less services I need. The ripple effect of people getting the services they need is they are working and giving back to the, their community. People see what we have to offer. We are givers, not just takers. It results in a win-win situation for society. Now how is that for results-based accountability? <laughs> nine years, there has been over $14 million in cuts to developmental disability services. And because of these cuts, the agencies have no more places to cut that won't directly impact us. At a recent advisory meeting with the commissioner, we heard that these cuts will reduce respite services, employment services, and community support services. Ooh. The cut will have a larger impact on people living with their families or on their own. These are the very services that allow us to live with dignity, respect, and independence. All our direct services, services for me, services for you, services for you, and for you. We cannot continue to balance the budget on the backs of the, our poorest and most vulnerable citizens. I am a self-advocate, and the self-advocacy movement is committed to lifting up people with disabilities. So the bottom line, we need services and supports to accomplish this. Thanks so much. concern um, that, are, that are on the table today in the uh, budget process. Um, Max has covered the developmental services very well, better than I could do it. <laughs> one of the things that he alluded to, one of the characteristics, unfortunately, of many of our peers is that they're not living on top of the economic pyramid, so to speak. There is a $300,000 set of cuts to Vermont legal aid that just plain shouldn't happen. Because of the way their services are structured and the contracts they have to represent people in mental health hearings, a cut, the $200,000 slice of that is going to directly affect what they can offer to people who are low income. And unfortunately, the overlap with this community is huge. Um, so that I want to put out there, when you're advocating for things, it's not a direct disability service, but that cut, that cut could really hurt our community because they do incredible work at helping keep, keeping people in their homes, helping them fight discrimination of different kinds, and helping them access uh, economic services that otherwise uh, take the sophistication of a lawyer to be able to handle the complicated uh, programs that are out there. The other part of that $300,000 $300, cut is about a $100,000 cut to the Office of the Vermont Health Care Advocate. And that program helps people figure out how to access payment for medical services. So if you've got a problem with Blue Cross, if you've got a problem with Medicaid, 
if you don't understand Medicare. Any of those healthcare finance people, I know my shop is full of experts. I love my people, and you won't find better people anywhere. But when there are detailed program things, we send them to the Vermont Healthcare Advocate at the Vermont Legal Aid. So those cuts, please don't forget those when you're talking with your legislators. The other thing that I want to highlight, another thing, I got a couple of more. They're going to throw me out of here by the time I'm done. Um, there's a promise broken, and I mentioned that in room 11 today. But last year, the legislature strongly supported putting some resources into the people who give direct services in mental health services and in developmental services. What we think of as our community mental health development, developmental service agencies and our special service agencies like Pathways, like Howard Center, like Washington County, and like NCSS, uh, you know, HCRS. These people, <laughs> hey, hey, here we go. We've got, what do we got? We got about 10 of the, of the basic agencies and I think there's five or six of the special services agency. Upper Valley Services. Um, somebody throw an egg at me if I forget yours and I, no, don't, please. All right, a shout out to Community Mental Health. Let's hear it, guys. These folks counted on a small raise last year. They got a 2.1% raise for direct service employees. And there was a commitment in, at the time that there would be another phase to that this year and that they'd be able to start looking up the scale so that their therapists and their social service, the people who give social services, would start to come to a closer percentage of what you'd get if you were doing the same service, say, as a state employee uh, or, or working in a school. And this year, that was not at all to be found in the governor's budget. So this is something that we need to be working for because as Max pointed out, people need these services. And it's kind of a double hit because they did the cut. He described to individual services, service plans, and they failed to give a raise. And um, it's a real, that's a heavy hit. That leads to worse turnover, um, uh, real problems. And then I wanted to point out, there's also things that don't get a lot of attention. Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired that helps people access education, access services. They've been looking to get a small percentage increase for, I believe, the last nine years. And their major programs have been level funded for that long. And they scramble to get private funding. They scramble for this, that, and the other thing. But they're not getting the help that we owe each other through state services and through state support. And then the one that I think hits me personally in a certain way that I can't explain because I'm not on the program myself, but the attendance service program being eliminated completely when about 30 years ago, when that was first uh, instituted in this country, that was a model. It's kind of, I make a little analogy, and it may not be great, but um, I guess it's not a great analogy. But I think about myself and my own life getting back and forth to work. Okay, I put that little orange tag on my mirror, and it, when the snow is all over the place, when it's all steep grades everywhere, except for those one or two designated spots, that tag, when I put that up, that's for me, that's a little bit of an equalizer. I can get around as well as Pat McDonald once I've got one of those, because I can park my car and get in and out. It just gives me a little chance to compete with the rest of the folks who don't have the same mobility impairments as I do. Well, if you think about 
something I think about. If my spinal cord injury had been a little bit worse at the fifth and sixth vertebrae, which is where it was hurt, if it had been a little bit worse, I would have needed personal care to be able to do things like toileting, feeding. If I didn't have the use of my hands, I got some use of my feet. I can, you know, put my own, throw my own chair in the back of my car. If I didn't have some of those things, I would need some attendant services. Somebody to help me do some of the basics. And then, boom, I'm off and running and, and I'll live a, you know, live a decent life. And we have peers, like, I don't know if any of you got a chance to hear Dave Saggy on the radio this noon, peers who have used that program and built their life. You know, they, they've done what they needed to do, they're getting out in the community, they are living a healthier life because they get out in the community. They have jobs, they, they can do so much more with a little bit to equalize with the rest of the people out there. And to me, it is shameless that that program has been frozen for three years and that they are talking about eliminating that program. And so it's not the biggest cut that's out there, but to me, it says something beyond just the dollars and cents. It says, you know, we don't care if you have to impoverish yourself to get state services. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give you state services, but you better spend down and qualify for Medicaid. You better be living on the edge of the economic cliff before we're gonna help you out. And it's really, to me, that's one, I just don't know what else to say, so I'll stop talking <laughs> about, about that. I am going to say one last thing before I open it up. If we have people from the press who would like to ask questions, I think all of us are available. If Marilyn's still here, I'm still here. Uh -huh. Max might have yeah. said that. If, uh, <laughs> uh, if people want to ask questions. But one other acknowledgement that I would like to, to, to give. Everybody in VC, uh, VCDR deserves a hand. Everybody in this room for coming out deserves a hand. have to say this. Stephanie Monty, who works at VCIL, deserves a hand because she has been the glue that has kept everything together. She's done an incredible amount of work to make this happen. Thank you all very much. And if there are questions, legislator is, is your best inroad. Let them know what these services mean to you directly or to a friend of yours. You know, like I said, one-fifth of Vermonters have a disability. How many, if you take any one-fifth, how many of those one-fifth have family members? We all got family, you know, of one sort or another. Acquaintances, people we care about. And so basically, everybody in the state is affected by disability issues. And so you got to let your legislators know that you are watching, you are thinking about that. Now, at the, the, the steps that are, the process are going through, this week, the House Appropriations Committee will be making decisions as to what they take in and out of the governor's budget to hand or to, to get voted on.
on in the House. So now these next couple of days are really important for telling your legislators, would you talk to people upstairs on that committee so they get a sense, holy mackerel, people care about the attendant services program or people care about developmental services. So the issues that are most important to you, let your legislator and since you're in the building, don't forget to pigeonhole your senators because they get another whack at the whole process. It goes through the whole process again in the Senate. So there's the short answer. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, what if you're a person with special needs who um, is getting some services but not getting a lot of services because they got one foot in, one foot out, you know, um, and not really considered disabled. How do you deal with those issues when you're dealing with legislators? Well, I think with a legislator, the best thing is to give them a picture of what you live through. And regardless of the degree of your disability, let them know how that affects your life. And if you have, um, if you are on some program but not another, let them know the ones that you think are important. And if you know other people who may have greater needs, like what I've just talked about, the attendant services, the participant directed attendant services program, I'm not on that program. But boy, I've known people that I really care about who have been and who are on that program. And so I have no qualms about telling people what that program is all about. So I think that's the, I think that answers your question. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Did somebody have a question? Oh. Step over that way, thing. Sorry, sir. Yeah. That's as far as we've got the court. Yeah, you have to be a little closer. A little bit more. Okay. Um, what would you do if, like, your parents in their, my parents are in their 60s, and my dad's going to be 71, um, and I'm trying to, like, um, have them, I don't know how to do this. Um, I don't know what decide or what they're going to do for, like, I don't know, move up here so I can take care of them. Okay, I think I, if I am understanding your question, you're asking, um, what do you do if you have older parents that look like they're going to need your help um, to take care of? That's, that's a hard question that we are all going to face as we get older. Um, and I don't have a, a real good answer for you there, but I think that what you may want to do is uh, talk to someone either in, in social services, either at your developmental service agency, explain it to them, and if they don't have a good answer, Calling Disability Rights Vermont or Vermont Legal Aid might be good because there may be something to do with your living circumstances. But I think the first place I'd go is, is, is the Developmental Service Agency, and they may be able to help you out, you know, looking at the individual situations of your case. Zach. You can come up. Um, this is a question, this is a comment for the cameras here. I, uh, I will have been here, I'm Zachary Hughes, I'm a good advocate around here, and um, I will have been 30 years in Vermont as of tomorrow. Um, and one of the things I like about Vermont is the variety of services we have here. One of the services that just was spoken about is the attendance service uh, program, and without that, my mom would not have been able to uh, do what she did. Um, my dad helped her uh, by getting paid through that program. 
Uh, this is a vital program, and I urge legislators and everyone else to take a look at it. And I'm kind of getting emotional as I'm talking about this this afternoon, and I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Comments? You have a question? Yeah. Come ahead. Uh, I have a question on, um, I know that you've talked about like the, the legal aid process and the guardianship piece, and I have a question on um, that, um, how to get the developmental services able to communicate with the legal aid person to, I wasn't quite sure about that part and wanted to learn more about that. I think I'm going to turn that over to Marilyn Mahusky. <laughs> show up at 4 o'clock. Hi, I'm Kirk Postlewaite. I am the Communications and Development Director at Washington County Mental Health Services here in Montpelier Barry area. And I'm here at the State House for Disability Awareness Day today. And I'm here uh, because this is such an important day for uh, some of the folks that we serve through Washington County Mental Health through our CDS program. Uh, it's so important to get more awareness um, out about uh, the folks that um, you know, we serve and the needs they have and making sure that they are you know, being seen as uh, people who are doing great things in their own lives and um, taking advocacy stands to ensure that they continue to get the support that they need for themselves and the people who help them uh, to live full and meaningful lives. Uh, Knowing that Trump is cutting lots of services, why is it really important for Washington County services, for people with disabilities, people with special needs, and disadvantaged? I think uh, I would go directly to what Senator Leahy's representative said, is that the six most important words in politics and maybe in general in society is, you have a story to tell. So the importance of having people with disabilities, whether they be physical, intellectual, et cetera, tell their stories so that people in the greater um, community understand that this is important work and that people are living. And it shouldn't just be one day. It shouldn't, it should be every day, right? People need to be aware of this every day. But through a day like today, more awareness is built and more people feel empowered to tell their stories. And by doing that, people understand that the, the votes to allocate more funding and to maintain and increase funding to these types of services are critical to maintaining the progress we've made not only here in Vermont but across the United States of America in supporting people with various disabilities. You don't mind me asking, do you have people with special needs in your family? And, and if so, how do you deal with services for them through programs like this? Yeah, I, uh, I do have uh, people in my family. My niece, uh, who lives in California, has a developmental disability, and uh, her mom is very involved with you know, making sure she gets the support she needs. Uh, and it takes a lot of advocacy, and the good news is, is that my niece is living a full, happy life because of the support she gets. 